Thank you, Anna. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, great to meet everyone here. I've already connected, like Anna mentioned, with Chris, but I'm looking forward uh, to meeting the rest of you. Me, Anna mentioned the TEDx talk. That brings me to my main contention, and I hope today we can have also a bit of discussion. And often for me, it's quite cool if people have different views on things. It makes things more interesting than usually I'm sure all of you are used to it where you go to an event and everyone's like, yeah, I agree with you. And everyone's nodding. So I hope we get some discussion today around looking at all our problems today and how interconnected they are. My contention is that our, the world's biggest problems are not economic, they're not political, and they're not even environmental. They come from our inability to imagine a future that is different to the current reality. And they come from a crisis of imagination. And it's important here also to make a distinction between individual imagination. So I can imagine I'm in a lovely island somewhere. And that's great, that might make me feel good and peaceful, but that's very different to collective imagination. And I think that's also the role of marketing and communications and experts like yourself. How do you create a shared sense of language and vision that people share? And we know historically, much of human progress has come from our ability to voluntarily imagine things that don't currently exist. So if we look out throughout history, progress has come from our ability to imagine, whether it's creating cities and moving from hunter-gatherers towards settled areas, whether it's imaginary inventions like money or going to the moon, none of these things existed until we were able to imagine them. The challenge I think is somehow, somewhere along the line, we started to believe that the world is fixed and it's only physical and it's unbending and that we can't really shape the outside world. And I've not yet done any research on this and it will be great to kind of hear from the group if any of you have. I think there's a co there might be a correlation. I'm not going to say there is a correlation. There might be a correlation between consumerism and our lost imagination, because within the context of consumerism, we become passive consumers of products, content, and reality, rather than active participants. We no longer feel like we can shape the world outside. We can only consume things. So. That's an area potentially to be explored. And if we do believe that much of our problems come from a crisis of imagination, then why are we not focusing any effort on that? Why don't we have the same way we have a department for health, environment, defense? Why don't we have a department for imagination? Why aren't we using our abilities to build capacity? Because often, the challenge is, and I think all of you will probably have your own experiences of this, imagination's a bit like creativity. It's not something, it's very natural and it's very human and all children have it. But somehow as we grow up, it's kind of beaten out of us. So the question becomes, how do we make sure we live a life and we live in a society where people can flourish and maintain their imaginations? Or conversely, within our current reality, how can we promote collective imagination? So that's just a bit of background. Um, to give a bit of context in terms of like the work I do and how it relates to imagination. So I run an organization called The People and we're a Gen Z consultancy powered by a global community of young change makers from all around the world. So everywhere from Brazil, to Nigeria, to Philippines. And a lot of these young people are living in some ways in the future. They are shaping the future. And what they're doing today is gonna to be shaping what happens in the mainstream. And our mission is to amplify the voices of young people 
and make sure they're involved in the creative and decision-making process. So we do a lot of work around co-creation and also we build new governance models. So for example, we set up youth advisory boards to make sure young people are involved in the process. But as part of that, again, we work, I know at the start people were mentioning like businesses and clients. We also have to work with clients and big businesses to help them reimagine what the future could look like. And often it comes from, here's where you are. Here's where you could be if you collaborated with the right partners and communities. And then once we're there, we can then ask the question of, okay, what could a more desirable future look like? And then just the final part uh, Anna mentioned in terms of my writing. So what I'm working on at the moment, which I think is very relevant to all of you and Marketing Kind is a book with a very, yeah, a very kind of provocative question around, do we need to change the world or do we need to change how we see the world? Because one of them is easier than the other. And then I guess I'd love to hear from you all. Thank you. And um, you, it'd be really good, I think, for everyone to, if we could get into maybe an example of how you're working with organizations um, in terms of how you're helping them to, we, we all can recognize big businesses that we've worked with that have gotten really good at shutting down any imagination and the results of that and um, kind of computer says no mindset. Um, so how do you practically work? How do, what does it look like when you work with an organization to help them to start to open that back up? Yeah, it, it's a great question. And I think in some ways uh, we're at an advantage just because of our proposition and how we work. So for not saying you can't create change in every medium, but if we were uh, delivering kind of programmatic advertising, it might be more difficult to have that conversation. But because we're very much focused on youth voices, democratization and participation, I think, for us, most of our partners come to us at a moment of change where the world around them is changing and they need to find a way to adapt to that reality. So, and I think I've learned the hard way. Uh, so the people has been running for six years to focus on people that share that vision, which is much easier than people that will never get it. So. Our focus is on people who really care and then a larger chunk of people who are persuadable if you can support them, if you can build capacity and educate them and get them on the journey. In, in our exchange a few days ago with John Miller, the author of The Activist Leader, um, he talked about the importance of, of stakeholder marketing. Um, and applying the conventional approach of marketing, but to other stakeholder groups where A, stakeholder groups that marketers don't usually get involved with, and B, stakeholder groups that businesses don't necessarily usually engage with in the same way as they engage with um, the people that I do not like to describe as consumers. Um, and it, that resonated with me and that, you know, my sense has been for some time that, you know, whereas, you know, the epitome of great marketing in the past might have been a Super Bowl ad, you know, one of the best briefs you could get in the future. It's more, you know, with an increasingly B2B environment with increasing pressures on sustainability, it's more, you know, how do you work with a mayor to unite local stakeholder groups and businesses around a shared vision for the future of that city, for example. Um, so that what what advice would you give in terms of, you know, you've done a lot um, through the people to work with brands and engage brands and the young people those brands are intended to serve together in some kind of a process of mutual influence and co-creation? You know, what possibilities would you see or what advice would you give people to extend a similar approach to, to other groups 
you know, how would you kind of make the environment a persona and co-create? Mm. How would you engage older people? Um, how would you tackle particular issues, um, asylum, immigration, whatever it might be? You know, are there ways to pick up on John's su suggestion of making marketing about all stakeholders and, and what could that look like? Yeah, um, really great question. And I think going back to that conversation with John, it was interesting, uh, similar to you, for what I picked up for him, it was equally as much about the employees of the organization and how it mobilized them, as well as the supply chain and the value chain. So I think there's an open question there about what is marketing and who is the audience. And you've written a whole book around collaboration, but briefly on kind of that point about collaboration, I think the process is very much the same, this idea of participation and involvement. And that looks different depending on what brand you're working on, what category you're working on. But ultimately, it sounds really simple. And I think sometimes in marketing, we tend to overcomplicate things. If you're creating something for a community or if your process involves certain communities, they should also be able to not just have a say, but participate in that process. So whether that's over 65s or for us, under 30s the process is similar so to be able to provide a tangible example i'm not able naturally to share like all our projects and client projects but one of the projects we're working on is exactly that how do you make sure all stakeholders are involved so in that project we make sure that leadership they ultimately make the executive decision but they're getting perspectives from young people from outside of the business, internal employees, and also supply chain. And what that means is when it comes to decision-making, it's not being made in silos, it's involving different groups. But to do that, I think it's really, being very honest, it's really difficult if you don't have leadership buy in right hopefully there's not too much noise in this coffee shop um so here comes the inevitable ai question <laughs> we're gonna have one in the hands of big brands do you see ai as a friend or foe in helping us reimagine the future and i put that at the beginning in the hands of big brands do you see ai as a friend or foe in helping us reimagine the future yeah it's it's in it's interesting that and i'll answer it kind of the wrong way around if it's okay Chris, I'll start with like society and work towards big brands. So what a trend we're seeing in our community is this kind of yearning for nostalgia. And that often comes where you feel really scared about the future and you seek refuge in the past. So whether it be watching kind of old movies, reruns, clothing, so even just the aesthetic. And I think we're at this kind of point where we're not, we're replaying old songs rather than creating new sounds. And if we were to use the same analogy when it comes to brands and AI, and I'm sure you've seen the conversations even around synthetic data. I'm not sure how many of you have kind of familiar with that. So this idea that for brands, rather than actually speaking to real people, they would create synthetic AI versions of them and run focus groups and interviews with them rather than asking real people. To the point about imagination, where I think that falls really flat is AI may, mainly is based on training data using old kind of information and data. So again, similar to society, we're regurgitating old information, images, and narratives rather than creating new ones. Yeah, so it has, just on that point, it has the potential to actually do the opposite and kind of, again, limit and restrict our imagination. Mm. No, I kind of agree with that. I think it's I think it's a great tool, but I do think there's a case of people using it to sort of fall back onto sort of create like a safety zone and 
almost think, oh, we can maybe just program in, yeah, what's the future look like and get an AI churning it out. Um, and I think the one thing about AI is it doesn't have much judgment. Yeah. yeah as, as, you know, um, Eleanor Crook, the great artist who's been working mid journey, said, AI has no eye. You can't tell mm. what's good or bad. Great quote, though. That is a great quote. Yeah. yeah. It's quite good for perspective. So if you were to say you're not the audience, um, what would someone in the Philippines think about this? It's quite good to be able to provide you with a perspective or prompt that you might not have. But yep. to imagine, again, I think that's a uniquely human capacity. 